Actually, it was um, the winter of 1977-78. There was um, what we call a blocking event, and there was a. I was in Cambridge at MIT at the time, and there was a huge snowstorm, uh, and this pattern was locked in, and it was locked in. We thought because of El Nino, so. I thought, ah, there's a good problem. We don't understand what El Nino is or where it comes from or anything much. It's important to be the first to enter the orchard. Uh, the fruit are low hanging. Uh, that's what happened to me and my colleagues in the 70s. The El Nino problem was like entering an orchard for the first time. One advantage we had is that we, had, we knew nothing. And so you obliged to try all sorts of things. Most of them fail if you succeed. What I guess I'm best known for is the first numerical model that convincingly simulated El Nino, and then it was used, we used it for predictions. And we got it to work in 1984, and in 1985, we actually used the model to begin to make forecasts. Jacob Bjorkness had established a kind of framework that turned out to be the right way to look at the problem. But we got to fill in the missing pieces that were uh, really missing, absent, totally absent. El Nino appears around Christmas time and flows southward. Uh, it was thought to be some unusual event that happens. Once we had long records, this was in the 70s, we realize that it's not a departure from normal, that it's a continual oscillation. It's there all the time. El Nino was just one phase of oscillation. And so a term was needed as a complement for El Nino. So anyway, I coined the term La Nina to indicate. It seemed natural. El Nino literally means the boy. And then so I thought it, La Nina. Once we could make forecasts, okay, then there got to be this question of what do you do with them? We wanted to uh, have an institution that could improve on prediction, that could also work on the issues of how do you make these, what we've learned about climate, more accessible to stakeholders around the world. And out of that, we have the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. And it's been going now for about 20 years. It's had enormous successes, and this information can be very valuable as we go on and try to figure out what to do about global warming, about anthropogenic climate change, uh, which is, of course, the major problem the whole world is facing at the moment. So I got to know Mark. I learned enormously from him. He is very brilliant. I should point out that the two of us getting this award, uh, I regard it as recognition for really a group effort. It's really an honor and a great pleasure to be sharing this award with uh, George Philander. George is an old friend. He's just a few years ahead of me. And I think George is the most creative oceanographer of my generation. And his contributions to our understanding of equatorial ocean dynamics and of the interactions between the ocean and atmosphere are absolutely indispensable. Winning the Vetlison Award is uh, a tremendous honor for anybody and a special, a special warm feeling for me because uh, I was the G. Unger Vetlison Professor at uh, Columbia. They funded my professorship. Uh, that was very nice. They uh, funded some of the important work I did on El Nino and on ocean modeling. And such support is going to be even more important now in the future as federal funding uh, has fallen off uh, appreciably and looks like that will continue. In some sense, I hope this is taken as an award for the whole tropical observational community. There's a large number of people who uh, contributed. Science is uh, a collective enterprise. To explain the El Nino, the oceanographers have to speak to the atmospheric scientists and vice versa. And so you can argue that the El Nino is a unifier. It, it, it forces people to integrate their activities. Uh, likewise, to understand climate, to understand global warming, 
you have to know something about many different disciplines. And that's what makes the whole field exciting. El Nino affects billions of people around the world. And when we started, virtually nothing was known about how it worked or how to predict it. And the work we've done has contributed enormously to improving prediction, to improving our understanding of how these events these in the physical climate system play through into agriculture, health, hydrology, and water management, and how to communicate that to people so that it can, in fact, improve their lives.